Hello, and welcome to the Dynamic Cycle webinar series presented by Tagleaf Industries. I am Donald Sturgeon, General Manager of Tagleaf Latin America, and I will be your moderator. I am proud to be part of the ninth webinar, and I will try to build on the momentum we have established so far. In addition to being the ninth Dynamic Cycle webinar in general, this is the third webinar in the redesign series. The subject of today's webinar is points of convergence between US and Europe on sustainability, which will be presented by Richard Freundlich from Rabobank, who I will be introducing in a few minutes. But before we get to Richard, I am particularly pleased to first introduce Dominic Leary. Dominic serves on Tagli's board of directors. He has been serving in this capacity since 2010, advising us on a range of strategies, initiatives, and recently developing Tagli's dynamic cycle. Dominic, I invite you to tell us more about Tagli's dynamic cycle initiative. Thank you, Don. Um, Dyna Ta Tagli's dynamic cycle initiative is a set of initiatives aimed to address sustainability issues within and for our stakeholders. It translates into uh, strategic choices, advanced know-how, and the most compliant portfolio. It is Tagleaf's trusted consulting voice that interacts with all its partners to contribute to the quality of life for generations to come. Within Dynamic Cycle, we have commitments, solutions, services, and corporate goals. And a subset of Dynamic Cycle is our, uh, could you, redesign um, component. With Dynamic Cycle, together we're taking purposeful steps in the right direction while we're all continuing searching and investing to foster sustainability for the future. Redesign is a tailor-fit service solution for our customers in which TI leads the switch from a traditional packaging structure to a more sustainable and innovative solution that best meets customers' specific packaging requirements. We work closely with authorities, industry experts, and certification bodies throughout the entire process to ensure our customers are offered the best qualified sustainable solutions. By partnering with TI, customers can discover ways to switch to high performing and environmentally friendly solutions, which can put them at the forefront of sustainable businesses that are aligned with circular economy principles. This also supports customers who want to cater to the growing concern and demand from consumers for more sustainable packaging that not only protects food, but also positively impacts the environment. Thank you, Dominic. I am now pleased to introduce our speaker for this ninth Dynamic Cycle webinar and our third in the redesign series. Richard Freundlich, Executive Director, Supply Chains, joined Rabobank New York offices in April of 2019 as a senior packaging analyst. He has an extensive background in packaging technology with over 40 years of experience. Richard has worked for Fortune 500 companies, including Celanese, Campbell Soup Company, Atlantic Richfield, and Sealed Air Corporation. He is well known for his experience in PET resin technology, having developed novel formulations and processes and holds over 20 US patents for his innovations. Richard, we're excited to have you with us today. Why don't you take it from here? I thank you, Dominic, for that introduction. And I thank Tagli for inviting me today. And I'd very much like to share with you uh, information about uh, sustainability which the talk is called the points of convergence between the US and Europe on sustainability. So with that, let's get into our talk. What I'll be talking about today is really four different areas. I'd like to give you a quick introduction to Rabobank for those of you who may not be familiar with Rabobank. And then we'll be talking about US sustainability and European sustainability. We're going to combine those two things together because they're intertwined and interrelated. And finally, we're going to talk about what's going on in the future. So with that, let's get started. I'd like to basically give you a little bit of background about Rabobank. We're a Dutch company. We're a cooperative that started in the late 1800s. 
uh, we're a food and agriculture focused business where we currently uh, uh, how franchise deals with about 40 of the leading packaging clients around the globe and about 15 out of 30 of the top listed global packaging companies. Uh, our commitments are over uh, 10.4 billion euros. Uh, we also work in the mergers acquisition and work with private equity uh, as necessary. So we cover. Um, next slide. I got to go. Okay, uh, we have global coverage on, on our teams globally. I mean, we're, we have a global teams that deal with consumer foods, farm inputs, horticulture, grains and oil seeds, animal proteins, beverages, dairy, and I'm on a specialty team called the Food and Ag Supply Chain Team, where we give industry seminars such as this, and we also um, uh, give key reports to our clients and about everything about uh, economics, the latest trends, et cetera. My team is made up of uh, the people looked on, on the slide. It's led by Susan Hansen out of the Netherlands and I'm based out of New York. I have my counterpart in supply chains in Toronto that handles paper, uh, but I focus mostly on plastics. And the bottom gives you an idea of the type of reports we do, but we do industry analysis. We work on pulp, corrugated, folding cartons. Uh, I work on uh, sustainability and plastic supply chains and particularly resin costs and uh, give this to our clients quite often, especially what's been going on with the resin prices over the last few months. Uh, so what we do is we cover regulations and packaging strategies and we, and we deal with our, our brand owners. Uh, they require innovative circular solutions. They are really right now looking at reusable, recyclable and uh, dealing with how to, how to create higher recycling weight rates, but also dealing with uh, waste management. Uh, so those four areas of sustainable sourcing, uh, design for recyclability, as you talked about, but these are all important areas. We give technical information and uh, end of life solutions. Uh, on this slide, we're really focus just, I'm just going to focus on North America and Europe, but what's Sustainability related packaging policies in the EU, EU, in the European Union is really in the pole position and but other recent regions of the globe are, are starting to move too. But Europe is highly advanced regulations as compared to North America. Uh, they have strong focus obviously on circularity, plastics and waste areas and a broad range of instruments uh, like outright bans, penalties, material specific recycling targets, plastics taxes are high on the list and the plastics pack in the UK. I'll be talking about a little bit more about what's going on there. But Portugal, France and the Netherlands and the UA, U, and the EU is uh, our focus. In North America, we are lagging behind the EU. However, recently there are many industry initiatives that are pushing investments in recycling for pla and plastics taxes are going on right now. I'll talk about that and reducing, the, there's a big push to reduce the use of plastics packaging. So there's many new regulations in the pipeline and some have been adopted, but there's many coming up. I'm not going to be focusing too much on Canada, just to say that there is a plastic pack between US and Canada going on. Uh, Single-use plastic uh, is a, uh, a focus and in this graph you get to look at this goes in terms of the uh, estimated new uh, national proposed single-use plastics regulations that are coming out and this you can see it's dramatically taking off but there's new policies in place. Uh, many of these regulations are set and focused on reducing the use of plastics packaging and improvements to handle the waste. And this is really because of the low plastic 
recycling rates that we're seeing. Um, global rates are eight to ten percent in the EU. The EU, uh, excuse me, the global rates are eight percent to ten percent. The EU averages about forty-two percent. This was the data from 2016. I know it's a little bit old, but the current date, even in the United States, when we look at the figures, it's very hard to get current numbers. But compared to the United States in 2015, it was like 14.6%. Now keep in mind that things like COVID in the US, we've seen dropping rates of, uh, of collection. And if you look at the biggest two materials, PET and HDPE, both of these have been decreasing. I mean, we were up to 30% uh, PET collection in the US, now it's like 28%. So, we're doing pretty poor. We're not doing as well as Europe. But in it, uh, so there's an increased focus on circularity and innovation. Uh, and of course, substitution is going on right now. So innovation in recyclability, increased recycle content of materials has been focused in converters and consumer goods companies. And with this lack of, uh, of collection, it, there's a big problem getting recycled materials. There's also anti-plastic policy. People are saying plastic is bad. And, you know, there, we feel very strongly that all plastic, all materials in, plac in packaging should be considered glass, paper, aluminum, and plastics. You know, this is just the latest example coming out this week to give you a great example. Look what's happening in Spain they came out and put an outright ban on the sale of fruit and vegetables in wrapping, in wrapping coming out in 2023. This has been pushed out and uh, instigated by Greenpeace. So legislation, legislation like the Green Deal that you're sure you heard of could be a game changer for packaging due to its recycling uh, targets. Uh, reuse models, greenhouse gas targets are all included, but, the, but basically all packaging is to be reusable, recyclable, recyclable in an economically viable manner by 2030, and this is including higher recycle rates. The, there is a push to uh, reduce and reuse as a model in, ahead of recycling and a proposed new business models based on uh, sh shift away from uh, shift away from single use or limited use pro uh, uh, products. So the stricter things on CO2 and uh, the regulatory framework for bio, there's a regulatory framework for biodegradable and bio-based plastics. And there's lots of concerns about microplastics in the environment and un un unintentional release of plastics and that needs to be addressed. So recent examples of relevant UV and national regulatory incentives, they're varying levels of impact of plastic packaging, but the single use uh, directive is there. It's applicable as of July 3rd, 2021, and member states have two years to transition to the national law. So as you see here, there's a whole series of measures in the future in terms of increasing uh, plastics, uh, recycle rates, uh, restrictions on our pet and, and bottles. In other words, uh, having a minimum amount going up to 30% our pet and PE bo PET bottles by 2030. In, the, in France, there's lots of activity related to food service industry and they just adopted a charter for food service packaging. But in the Ministry of Eco, Eco ecological transition, they proposed initiatives to reduce plastic waste, and they have series of measures starting from 2021 going, th go going onward to target 70% uh, of the packaging to be non-single-use plastics packaging. These are going to have great impacts in the future. Here's an example of just one uh, in the UK I mentioned before. Is This is an example of cling wrap and What's interesting about the UK is that this tax is coming in force in April of 2022. 
it, 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 the Treasury position is that 200 pounds per ton will apply to any tax liable plastic packaging where 30% of the content cannot be demonstrated. So what's interesting here is what the thing is called liable packaging as a finished component will be considered liable parties. So in the case of imported packaging, this will likely sit with the importer. And, the, and in the case of UK manufactured packaging, this will sit with the converter. So this tax will apply to, to packaging components where the recycling content is less than 30%. So the secondary final draft of this legislation is too shortly, and many, many producers are now uh, uh, ramping up and preparing for this new tax. So let's talk about the uh, US a little bit. We have something called the US Plastic Pack. And this proposed is uh, looking at a rate of 50%. And it's a coalition of business, government, and NGOs that are, that are calling for packaging recycling rate of 50% or more in recycling content. And what's interesting about this is that major people, uh, more than 60 companies are behind and trade groups are, are behind this. And the signers such as Coca-Cola, Walmart, et cetera, and, the, and even Amcor, the PET Association, have joined forces. So this is something to be watched. So let's talk about extended EPR, or extended producer responsibility. This is a term that most people don't hear a lot about, but it's being talked about. But millions of tons of post-consumer packaging enter the waste stream. And this term, extended responsibility, refers to ensuring that packaging producers assume some responsibility for the cost of collecting and sorting recyclables, and it's responsible for end of life. So there are many legislation examples. I've only put a few, but there's many more. Keep in mind, in the U.S., there's mostly legislation at the state level and very little at the, gov at the government level. We have been ineffective in getting government legislation, so What's so hard to track is that every state has does their own thing. It's not, it's not, we're not anywhere as advanced as what we see in Europe. So what's going on right now, and this is the hot topic, and it even, uh, there's been some news today on this, is that we are going through a budget plan and, and they're fighting to get a 3.5 trillion budget plan. Well, in that budget plan is a plastics tax that's proposed and this was uh, introduced by Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat from Rhode Island, and he is calling for uh, he is calling for a, a tax of 20 cents per pound. Today, in today's news, 20 industry groups have, have signed a uh, a document trying to fight this. So this is uh, far from being settled. We don't know what's going to happen, but it has great implications all across all supply chains that use plastic in the United States. It's, it's, it's a scare. So let's go on to this, uh, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this. So let's talk about um, sustainable packaging strategies a little bit. And what we have here is uh, it's what's really important uh, is in terms of the regulations and policies, the consumers, they demand change. And there's multi-stakeholder initiatives. And what's going on is that there's three different components that are going on. There's all these different plastic packs going on and alliances like the Holy Grail Initiative, Ceflex, and others, uh, the Ellen MacArthur, all very, very influential. And what's going on is that it's very uh, critical to consumers and investors. We're watching this. Our clients are keep on asking it because it has great influence on what's going on in the future. So we need to track that, and we do. Just to give you an example, um, some of the key sustainable brand owners you see here, and each one of them have their each one of these companies <clears throat> have sustainable packaging strategies, and we track them. But lots are tied to food waste and reduction targets. These are sustainability. We've given many talks on food waste and how packaging prevents food waste, particularly plastic packaging. We're talking about weight reduction as a strategy. And we talk, you're going to hear more and more, just as we hear sustainability term, the new one was going to be 
carbon emissions and reductions and what we call decarbonization will be the new buzzword in my opinion over the next five years the great implications and cost in the supply chains about how we manufacture plastics and, and even sustainable manufacturing so next to recycling and recyclability the the there's a great focus on brand owners to try reuse schemes and opportunities for other competitive materials so when we look at oh my god is plastics going to go away? The answer is no. But there's, these are cyclics, and they go up and down. And what's hot today will not be tomorrow. But you just can't change so easily a product when you design it. It has to do with shelf life, oxygen-sensitive foods, and things like that. But there is a place for all materials, and we shouldn't overreact to the uh, as plastics manufacturers that plastics are going to go away. But plastics manufacturers do need to be more responsible. So how is this going to happen? It's going to happen through innovation. And we look very strongly to innovation as one of the uh, ways that sustainability will uh, enable plastics packaging to continue. So let's look at what's important. Well, sustainability requirements the converters have to remain competitive with other materials. So what that means is that we have to design for recyclability and we have to be smart about how we use materials. We need, you know, there's green materials, there's all different options out there and consumers are pushing for these sustainable uh, options. However, many times these things are not cost effective or they don't do the job or if they do the job, it comes at some consequence. And that consequence many times is shelf life. So depending on what part of the world, in, in the United States, for example, we have longer uh, needs for shelf life because the uh, distances to transport items are more. And then there's in Europe where shorter runs and more flexibility. But things like digitalization, which I talk about, may be helpful in, in these solutions. We'll talk about that a little bit. So plastic film suppliers and converters, they are looking at innovative packaging solutions to solve these problems. So what they're doing is they're being pushed to increase recycle content, uh, the developing innovative solutions such as uh, down gauging the materials, using mono materials is a big trend, using novel fabrication technologies like orientation that use crystallization as a method of increasing barrier, but there's void technologies, foaming technologies, all of these are ways to reduce the footprint and make things more competitive and more effective and, and as it deals with sustainability. So plastic supplies, they're offering mono materials. Uh, they've done some really good innovative things, uh, but it's not a silver bullet. They come with consequences. Uh, sometimes uh, things like just machinability coefficient of friction, as is how does feed go through, through machines. All these different type of products uh, I mentioned here are innovative. However, they uh, packaging engineers need to think outside the box. So the response to the, the response the response from competitors to sustainability chance, chances they're doing all these things I mentioned, but also I wanted to mention it's a big system of elimination of unnecessary packaging, minimization of packaging that Amazon is called, has really focused on, has put people to make stronger products, stronger films, and, and make the innovation to reduce the amount of packaging. Now I want to talk about one of the most hottest hot topics that we've been dealing with at Rabobank. It's called advanced recycling. <clears throat> you might have heard of re advanced recycling. Um, this, there's absolutely um, no shortage of looming issues to it, uh, that are going on. But what we're seeing in advanced recycling, you might have heard the term chemical recycling. The whole recycling area deals with mechanical as well as chemical recycling. And it has to deal with, you know, looking at cost and technology feasibility of waste 
we were looking at competitive technologies of mechanical uh, recycling and use of compatibilizers also is very interesting in terms of uh, optimizing material innovation. But with all these new technologies, environmental hurdles have to be overcome. And many people don't want these technologies, the NIMBY thing, not in my backyard. But there's question marks about the potential toxicity and carbon footprint of these advanced technologies. And uh, really, where is all the feedstocks going to come in to feed these processes? So there's also certification and closed loop transparencies and trustworthy issues. And how do you uh, uh, confirm the, the authenticity and quality of some of these materials? Well, what's interesting is things like uh, uh, Internet of Things, tech, uh, uh, digitalization, uh, blockchain technology and other tracing technologies are being employed and we're monitoring them as well in guiding our clients on the innovation uh, in terms of blockchains and things like the IBM Food Trust and things like that have been promoting it. But there's also legislation coming down the line and that's different from, from the US to, to, uh, to Europe and other parts of the world. There's different preferences. So right now, um, what's going on is uh, there's huge uh, uh, investments going on in, uh, in the U EU, for example, in chemical or advanced recycling, dealing with pyrolysis. And I'll describe that. It's basically a high heat process in the absence of oxygen, where you can turn uh, mixed commingled plastics back into syngas and other fuels and char, and also can go back into creating the building blocks of polymers so that they can be remade. It's a very interesting te technology. The Netherlands and Pla are uh, highly advanced in this. Uh, Sab Sabic and Eastman are working on it, but a company called Plastic Energy is working with these companies. Uh, Sealed Air has an alliance with them, for example in using pyrolysis and basically they use something called thermal anaerobic technology where they take mixed plastics waste and they turn it to something called ta coil and that is used to rebuild polymers to virgin type polymers you can't distinguish them okay so we've come out i've mentioned that uh, rabobank is very involved in this we've issued three reports and uh, they're available through our our management so Deal with if you don't have a uh, a relationship manager, contact me, and we'll get somebody to contact. We've had three reports on advanced recycling. One was issued this week by uh, my coworker. Uh, I've issued two in, uh, as part of the team. But in general, I'll just want to summarize what these reports say. There's ten learnings that we've got from advanced recycling. Just saying that the year 2020 was a year of great announcements. And Europe is is currently the hottest region for investments. Uh, what we see, though, however, is by 2025, the U.S. will be leading the pack, and we see this because of what's going on, who's investing. Um, we're seeing all these collaborations between major chemical companies, brand owners, and that is key to get this accomplished. Uh, but the petrochemical chem companies are really in the game and they're pushing this. That the, right now, the chemical companies are betting on a variety of different technologies with no winning technology uh, evident. But there's no short of evident of looming issues and controversy. There's been a lot of the negative press, things that say that don't work, et cetera. This is not going to go away, but we need to be critical and look at it very carefully. So what's this end? This is a good example of all the different companies, as you can see, in France, Denmark, US, UK, Europe, they're all partnerships going on. I don't want to say more about that because I'll leave this and they, this talk can be picked up and you could uh, read these things at your leisure. But the number, this look at the global snapshot here of plants, they could double in capacity and quadruple between 20, 20 and 20 between 20 and 2025 and as i said us is going to be the leader here as we're dealing in europe let's go okay europe is currently the the hottest region 
for investors with 50% of all commission plants now uh, by 2025. So you see the Netherlands, UK, France, and Germany, lots of activity. And these are the companies involved. As I mentioned, US is gonna be the leader and look at all the companies that have uh, interest in this. It's, it's really very, very interesting. And it's, I believe it's going to happen. However, you're going to hear companies like Tomra who do mechanical recycling getting very excited and threatened by this. Now, let me say this right now. It's not because key to its success is mechanical recycling as a feed into these all these new advanced processes. So let's not get carried away. And uh, I've had discussions with people trying to calm these people down. So we're talking about everybody, all the brand owners, uh, they're looking at advanced recycling and they're trying to put together their uh, sustainable strategies based on that. Summing it up, advanced, I do think it's red hot, but it, it's not the silver bullet for plastic waste yet. Um, we will watch this. Again, there's controversy on amount of energy and carbon footprints, things like that. But so let's see where that takes us. Uh, let's do a summary now. So in, in summary, the plastic packaging industry chain is, is um, disrupted by regulations and stakeholder demands and they're driving innovation, but digitalization, I didn't mention as much as I should have because of limited time, but that's a whole subject I think is worthy of discussion. Things like RFID uh, and uh, uh, other technologies, uh, even Bluetooth onto labels, Digital, foot, uh, digital markings, et cetera, are all coming into play. But the impact on plastic packaging is, from legislation is going to grow in intensity and scope, and it's going to be driven by the U uh, e European un Union initiatives. The sustainable packaging strategies in the major brands, the spurring disruptions, investments, and innovation in plastic packaging. The plastics packaging chain operators will respond to the disruptive chains with innovation. Uh, there's one, not just one shoe that fits all. So beyond sustainability, digitalization, and the internet of things, I, and uh, that is, I have a, a love for that subject. And, and I really think that things like digital printing and all these things and tying, particularly in Europe, tying these things to uh, SAP and other type systems, will be great advances. But the IoT, it's in the central areas of innovation. They're going to be in, uh, essential for, for packaging companies to be competitive. So with that, I hope you have uh, uh, enjoyed my talk. And if you have any questions, I'd be welcome to take it. Or if you can't get it done today, please reach out to me and uh, I would welcome any interaction. And thanks so much for the invite. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, very interesting um, and extensive coverage. We will open it up now to the audience for questions. We will collect your questions and uh, we'll field as many of those as we can. Um, we'll be responding to all the questions um, following the meeting. So <clears throat> with that, let me share with you the first question. Um, so Richard, you mentioned uh, pyrolysis. Can you elaborate on uh, pyrolysis and its relevance to sustainability and perhaps uh, also touch on the term top oil that you used? Richard, I believe you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah, okay. This is, as I said, is a hot subject. The term pyrolysis I mentioned relates to a, uh, a oven process that basically it's done in the absence of air. There's, you'll probably may have heard two terms, pyrolysis and gasification. They're somewhat different. Uh, gasification is another technology that is longer term, but short term right now we're seeing great, uh, lots of activity in py uh, pyrolysis to handle mixed waste streams. So when people, is very difficult when you have co-extruded, have aluminum in the structure, all these things that can't be recycled. 
well, this tech, these technologies can handle. They take these materials, they put it in a, in a furnace between 300 and 900 degrees centigrade with limit without oxygen, and they change the, they basically break it down into simpler hydrocarbons and char, and they basically can use catalysts and they can break it down to syngas, ethanol, diesel fuel, and, and other components that are the basic building blocks of monomers that they can reconstruct and then repolymerize it back into it. So this waste, the, some char can be used uh, is can be used in uh, re as reinforcements. Uh, these are very inert type things, uh, and then there's the oils, the syngas, and, and other. It's demonstrated. It's happening now, and it's uh, the. I think the, the verdict is out whether or not it's cost effective or energy effective, but some place people are using the syngas to fuel the furnaces, et cetera. So I hope that answered the question. It's, it, 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 it's, a, it's also going to free up the world about, hey, we need to go to biodegradable or compostable products it re because it, it doesn't matter. This process can handle almost anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for that. The next question we received is the following. Environmental issues have come in and out of cycles in the past decades. Is this cycle different? And why do you think it might be different? I think it is different. And it's different now because of, of the pressures that we are seeing in global warming, weather changes that are affecting everything. Um, I mentioned decarbonization as being a trend that will be have great implications on how products are made, how how companies will uh, fuel their energy needs. Uh, you know, we see all this plastic waste in the ocean, and and this tremendous uh, impact on that. And also, we're finding microplastics in in, in fish and and other two food chains and this is going to, this is a time bomb so unless the industry wakes up and does something i think we're going to have some serious implications and taxes like we're being proposed right now to clean up everything we need to take responsibility and that won't go away so the answer is yes it's different and it's more because of the demands and people and consumers are also demanding it okay. thank you richard and then um we have time for one last question. Um, paper is often used as a replacement for plastic, but many of us remember when saving the rainforest was the issue. Can you comment on the dynamic between paper and plastics? Well, uh, you know, I am prejudiced uh, because I'm a plastics guy and uh, I come from the plastics industry, but I'm a packaging engineer and I was a packaging engineer for Campbell Soup for many years where I had to deal with paper, glass, aluminum, metal cans, everything. So I have an appreciation for the, I say, there's, the, there's room for everything. And paper, right now, the, the cycle is going towards paper, but paper has issues. People think that paper is sustainable. They think it's, uh, but paper has problems. It's not uh, as compostable as you might consider. They have to repulp it. If you have coatings on it, it you can't recycle it well. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of innovation in hybrid structures, things like using biopolymers like polyhydroxyalkylate PHA as coatings. So you put a coating on a, on a piece of paper, it is a replacement for wax, for example, so it can be repulped. Uh, it then makes it more degradable. Uh, so these hybrid structures, I think, are innovative, but there's always a consequence. As I mentioned before, when you're dealing with food particularly, if it's most, many, many foods are oxygen sensitive and you have to deal with transmission of oxygen through the walls of the object, through its seals, headspace oxygen, dissolved oxygen in the product, all these factors play a role in shelf life. So although it looks good, you, what are you giving up? You might get better cost, but you're going to lose something. So uh, God giveth and God taketh away. Uh, there's no, there's no uh, panacea here. So the answer is there's room for everything. We need smart, intelligent engineers who understand life cycle analysis and don't overreact to industry pressures, but keep in mind what's our job? 
to deliver food safely to end users. Well, that's all the time we have for today's webinar, but all your questions have been collected and we will respond via email. I want to thank very much Richard of Rabobank and thank you, Dominic, for uh, being with us today. I also want to thank all the attendees for joining us today. To learn more about TagLease Dynamic Cycle and our webinar series, I invite you to visit dynamiccycles.ti-films.com and to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.